How do we teach our people how to study the Word of God for themselves? Dr. Chuck Swindoll is our guest this week talking about principles that we can give them to help them love to study God's Word. It's all on episode 67 of the Church Leaders Podcast. Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping you lead better every day. And now here's your host, podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, Andrew Hess. Thanks for tuning in to episode 67 of the Church Leaders Podcast. I'm Andrew Hess, your host, and I'm excited about our guest this week. We're talking with Dr. Chuck Swindoll, um, the popular author and pastor. He has a well-known radio program called Insight for Living. We talked to Dr. Swindoll about how we can teach our people to study the Bible for themselves. It's a powerful discussion about how we, as pastors, can study the Bible well, but also how we can teach our people to love to study the Bible for themselves. And now, here's our conversation with Dr. Charles Swindoll. Well, Dr. Swindoll, what what an honor to have you as our guest on the Church Leaders Podcast today. Well, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be with you and look forward to our time together. Dr. Swindoll, you are mostly well known as amazing preacher and teacher of God's Word. Tell us about where that passion to faithfully proclaim the Word of God first began. Well, I don't know about the amazing part. That's a little bit of height there, but uh, I appreciate your kind words. My contagious enthusiasm for spiritual things began probably at home, where I was raised. My mother loved the Lord, and uh, my father was a God-fearing man. We grew up in a family that was a happy family. Uh, We were not perfect, but we resolved conflicts correctly and swiftly, so we didn't drag our problems into a big dysfunctional issue for a family. We we had fun together. We sang together. We enjoyed life together. We worshiped together. So I guess it all started there. And then I married a woman when I was uh, a young adult who also enjoyed life and loved the Lord. Uh, And that's what drew me to her. Uh, And we began our lives together uh, in that way. I've been mentored by contagious uh, men who really love the Lord, and because of that, there's been a good influence. I chose a seminary that really honors the Word of God, and, and so I was pleased to be around faculty who really love the Lord and, and were excited about His truth. And uh, certainly Howie Hendricks, to whom I dedicate my book, Searching the Scriptures, uh, who is now gone, but was a a turning point in my own life as I picked up from him some principles for seeing what the Bible says and understanding how to interpret it and then ultimately how to teach it. So I've been a very blessed man these 81 years, and I've not lost my enthusiasm, Mm -hmm. including today. Yeah, very excited about what I'm doing. That and that is very uh, clear. Like just the contagious excitement you have for God's word. Take us back to those early days when you had Dr. Hendricks, a famous professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. What was it like to be a student in his class? It was one of the greatest privileges a person could ever have. That's not exaggeration. In 1959, we met. I was a first year student. I took everything he taught. Every course he taught, I took. He was my major professor. The best thing I ever learned from him was his wonderful course of Bible study methods. And uh, from him, I learned uh, the value of uh, knowing how to read the Bible uh, and that it speaks to me, that I can actually understand it. There are ways to interpret it that are reliable trustworthy and accurate, and from him, I picked up the techniques that I use to this very day. Over 50 years of ministry, and I rarely ever speak without going through the same process I set forth in the book. And the book is not written to seminarians. It's written to everyday people because the world is full of everyday people. God gave his word to everyday people, those who may never see the inside of a college, who may have never finished high school, but they can read 
and they have a Bible in their language, and they're willing to take the time. And if you're willing to do that, you too can be excited about truth. And I really mean that. I'm not trying to sell a book. I'm trying to convince people you can do this. In fact, you should be doing this. It'll deepen your life. It'll it'll make you stronger. It'll stabilize you. It'll give you a reason to be joyful as you get up in the morning. A purpose for living. It has all the benefits that go with knowing what God has said. He's not hiding from us. He's revealed his word. He's revealed his will. It's all there for you to discover. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the the great analogies that you draw in the book is you compare searching the scriptures and, and growing in our knowledge of God's word with eating a meal or getting physical nourishment. Can you, can you talk about that analogy? Yeah, I follow that motif all the way through. I look for one that would be used in any language or any culture, in any nation, around any part of these, uh, 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 around this world in which we live. Everybody has to eat. Most people fix their own meals, or at least we have d- done that from time to time. Uh, We're in a fast food era, unfortunately, so what we eat is not nutrition. But if you fix your own meals, you start with finding the food, and that's where the book starts. I help people understand how the Bible's put together a right to everyday people, not to seminary people, so that everyday people can understand where to find the food, uh, how to follow the recipe, and then you begin the process of observing what the Bible says, interpreting what the Bible means, correlating verses to see what the Bible says elsewhere, and then applying the scriptures. What does it mean practically to me? So we build a bridge from the ancient days to the 21st century to discover what's in the Bible. And then having prepared the meal, we serve it maybe to ourselves or to someone else, maybe to our family, to friends, maybe neighbors, some people who are in your home Bible class, Sunday school class, or if you're a preacher, to your congregation. Let me go back to that observation, because that's a key. Years ago, I was with my son, and we were driving along in a pickup. He had his pickup, and I was sitting on the other side, and he said, see that FedEx truck up there? And I said, yeah, I see it. You see the arrow? And I said, arrow. He said, yeah, look closely, Dad. I said, I see the truck. I see the words FedEx. I don't see the arrow. He said, Dad, look. Look between the E and the X. There's an arrow there. You know what? I had never seen that arrow before. And I've been sending packages on FedEx for years. It's their logo tucked away in between the E and the X. Now, there's a lot of arrows tucked away in the scriptures. If you're in a hurry, you'll miss them. If you are determined you're going to read into it what you want it to say, you're going to miss them. If you look past them so that you can get to the next 10 chapters in this 20-minute period, you're going to miss them. But if you're willing really to look And that's what I do. I simply look to see what it's saying. I'm observing what is there. I'm reading thoughtfully. I'm reading prayerfully. I'm reading aloud. I'm reading from different versions. I'm not doing anything you've got to go to seminary to do. Anybody can do it. It's helpful to have some tools that will say a dictionary will help you a book that carries all the words of the Bible and called a concordance, which is an alphabetical listing of all the words in the Bible. That'll help. A set of maps, that'll help you. You can get a lot of these online. Logos is one of the ways you can do it. If you want to work online, that has all that available on your computer. But it takes some time. I say 20 to 30 minutes a day. You do that, you'll grow. You'll be strengthened in your life. You'll have something to look forward to. You'll see the arrows (laughs) that are there. 
that you've been missing all your life. That's really good. I think one of the things that I think um, we live in a day where there's so much great Bible teaching. Uh, you can get on podcasts or there's video series online. Sure. I think a lot of people, it's easy for them to kind of outsource their study of the scripture and just listen to great teaching. How important right. is it for people to to learn to study the Bible for themselves? Well, how important is it for you to fix your own meals? One of the marks of adulthood is the ability to fix your own meals. You, you start simple. You boil eggs. You you learn how to how to uh, fix meat. You learn how to cut up vegetables. You learn to you get a cookbook and you read a recipe and you learn how to follow it. You have to be a high powered chef. Now, if you want to have somebody else fix your meal, that's fine. You'll never grow. You'll never become self sustaining. Hard times hit. That person that's been teaching you all your life on the radio or or in a particular method you've used to get that message from someone else, they won't be there. But if you've taught yourself, you'll be stabilized. So it's just a matter of whether you want to grow deep or not. I think it was Richard Foster said, today we don't need richer people. We don't need more intelligent people. We certainly don't need busier people. We need deeper people. If you want to grow deeper in your faith, if you want to be able to stand up and defend what you believe in the ears of a cultic group, if you want to be able to give an answer for the person at work who asks you, why do you believe that? You've got to dig it out, man. You've got to get in there for yourself. You may learn some things from others, and I certainly do appreciate others. I certainly do appreciate those that love the Lord and are teaching His Word. But I learn the most when I dig in for myself. And I've got a lot of books, and I refer to them as part of my preparation. But you don't need a lot of books. Most people are not preachers. And you don't need to know Hebrew and Greek. Most people will never know that. You can get an atlas that will take you, or a set of maps that will take you to the Bible lands. You don't have to go to the Holy Land. You see, all of this is doable. But we've been sold a bill of goods. We've been left with the idea that you've got to be some kind of super-duper, highly gifted, amazing individual. No, you don't. Do you read English? Yeah. You have a Bible? Yes, I do. You have 20 minutes a day when you can turn the TV off and on your own begin the process of fixing your own spiritual meal. Could you do that? Yes, I could. Then do it. And you know what? It'll change your life. It'll literally change your life. When I took Dr. Hendrick's course and I went home to carry out the assignments, by the end of that semester, I could hardly sleep. I was so excited. I really was, because I realized I've tapped into a method that I can take with me for the rest of my years. And that's exactly what I did. So it occurred to me, since so many people ask me, how do you do that? How did you find that? How did you know what to say when you were teaching this? How did you see that in the I wrote the book for that reason. This explains how anybody can do it. And I'm serious. Any house, any, any homemaker, any businessman, any unemployed individual, any teenager, any salesman, anyone in any profession, any blue-collar worker, anyone, mother, dad, single, married, Divorcee, anyone, anyone, anyone can do it. If you can read English, if you have an English Bible, and you take the time. But you see, it requires the discipline of 20 to 30 minutes a day. Well, do you take time to eat? Yes, I do. You eat once a week? 
No, I don't. You eat once a day? Actually, I don't. I eat several times a day. If you need that for your physical body, doesn't it make sense that you need it for your spiritual life? Yeah, it does. Then do it. Hmm. Do it. Just, the old Nike ad, just do it. The arrows are there in FedEx. The nuggets are there in Proverbs and Psalms and Ecclesiastes and Isaiah and Matthew and Philippians and Revelation and Genesis and the life of David and the life of Elijah. I could go on and on and on. There's an ex- inexhaustible body of truth and people let it sit there and collect dust. The reason is they don't think they can do it. They don't know how. This book will tell you how to do it. You follow it, you become a deeper, transformed individual. Guaranteed. And not because I wrote it, but because these are principles I was taught and I have put into practice for over 50 years. And you know what? They still work. I was preparing a message on the feeding of the 5,000, which is coming up in my study in Matthew for this coming Sunday at our church. I went to the passage as if for the very first time. I read it aloud. I read it repeatedly. I'm in Matthew 14. Begins about verse 13 down through verse 21. That's the section. I spent my entire week on Matthew 14, 13 to 21. I read it over and over and over and over. I pictured it in my mind. I wrote some thoughts down. I checked other passages that dealt with the same thing. Mark 6 carries the same message. John 6 carries the same story. So I correlated it with the others. And then thought it through, and I began to look for how it applies. The feeding of the 5,000 is about God doing the impossible. That doesn't take a brilliant mind to come up with that. Here were not 5,000 people, but over 20,000 people. There were 5,000 men plus women and children. Most people don't know that because the old tradition is he fed 5,000. No, he fed probably 20 to 25,000. All he had were five pieces of flat bread and, and a couple of sardines. That's all he had. Impossible until you realize they were in the hands of Jesus. So he said, bring the people to me. Give me the bread and the fish. Then he multiplied all of that. Miraculous, of course. How did he do it? Well, because he's able to do the impossible. Now then, stay with me. My job is to build a bridge from the first century when that happened to the 21st century where people live today. And guess what? Everybody listening to me today faces something impossible. It may be an impossible marriage. I mean, we'll never get our marriage together. They they come to church thinking it's impossible. I got a son who is impossible. Tried everything I know to try. I can't change him. He's impossible. I got a financial situation. It's impossible. We can't even pay for our apartment every month. I got a car that isn't running well. It's an impossible situation, and I don't have the money to fix it. Or health, I've got a bad issue with my health, and it's impossible. You know what? Not in the hands of God. And what a difference it makes when you realize, I can take what looks like an impossibility and give it to him, and I realize that was only a disguise. So my statement at the end of my message is we're all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. Let me tell you something. Every person in our church on Sunday will be on the edge of their seat if they've got a brain and if they've been listening because it touches where they live. This book helps you do that. 
It's not magic. I'm not that bright a guy. I'm not that brilliant a guy. But I am disciplined. And I do study. And I do pay attention to the arrows in FedEx. Funny, every time I see FedEx, all I can see is the arrow. When I get to certain passages now, all I can see is what I saw in them when I dug away at them and found the nuggets. By the way, you ever seen an archaeologist at work? They're never in a hurry. Hmm. They're digging. They're brushing away dirt. They're blowing away sand because they've come upon this incredibly valuable artifacts, this treasure, and they're wanting to pull it out of the earth without breaking it. So they take their time. So I talk about in the book, take your time. What's the rush? What is the rush? It's not a question of how much did you get through the Bible? How much the Bible got through you? That's the question. Hmm. It's not how quickly you read Philippians. It's how thoroughly did Philippians examine you. Hey, that takes time. Respect it. God took 1,500 years to record his word. Use 40 different authors, 40 different writers to give us his word. And we let it collect dust? We think only a preacher could tell me what it says? That's what the Catholics teach. Priests tell me what to believe. They're the ones that interpret the Bible. Ultimately, the Pope. Wrong. There's been a reformation. The reformers discovered this book is for us. Luther wrote it in the vernacular of the German. Calvin made it available to the French-speaking people. Savonarola wrote it for the Italians. Wycliffe put it in English and went to the state for it because it was a radical that they think they can understand the Bible. See, the reformers paid the price. Now we've got the Bible in our own language, and what do we do? We rely on somebody else to feed us? Something's wrong with that picture. No wonder we're, we're stunted in our spiritual growth. No wonder we still don't learn the same lessons again. We're not digging away to feed ourselves. We're eating fast food. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's really good. And a lot of the people in our audience are pastors and ministry leaders. What are some of the challenges, the unique challenges that those who are teaching the, the scriptures regularly what are some of the, the common mistakes that we have to avoid when we're, when we're doing that? You bet. Great question. First of all, you've got to be disciplined in the use of your time. You must have a day or two that you're going to set aside for study every week. You must. You must train your congregation to respect that. You must. And most of the time uh, in, in my past, I was in small churches, and I trained the congregation to respect that. I have to prepare. Well, all I'm going to give you on Sunday is leftovers that somebody else cooked. So take uh, respect the time factor. Number two, be sure you pray. Ask the Lord for insight, for the ability to see those arrows that are there, to pull out the nuggets. Third, always remember that we're living in the 21st century. But the book was written in the first century and earlier. So build a bridge. Now don't build a bridge immediately. Make sure you take the verses in context and explain what the verses meant to the people back when it was written. What does this mean to them? Now then, having done that, what does it mean to us? Think about everyday situations and apply it there. Keep it interesting. I read somewhere the worst sin you can commit in public is to be boring. And preachers can be notoriously boring because they forget about the value of word pictures, using illustrations, drawing on everyday parts of life, connecting with people where they are, the Sunday following 9-11, uh, 
every church in America was full. Why? Because for the first time in many people in this generation, they reached an impasse when they realized America is forever changed. So what did they do? They came to the place where they expected to hear timeless information. And anybody who preached that day and didn't address 9-11 missed the chance of a lifetime. Hmm. People want to know, how do I endure times like this? And believe me, Second Timothy makes it clear they're just going to get worse. So how do I stay encouraged knowing that times will get worse? How do I know where to turn knowing that times will be difficult? So keep it relevant. Help people see how relevant the scriptures are. And finally, I would say, before you have finished, give people principles to carry with them. Make sure you've broken it down so that your bridge that you've built gives them something they can remember. The other day we were finishing Romans 8, and there's a passage there that says, if God be for us, who can be against us? And I had everybody stop. I said, listen to these words. God is for us. He's not against us. He's for us. So say those four words with me. And I had everybody repeat, God is for us. I said, let's say it again. God is for us. I'm I'm talking to people that are, some are professionals, some have their PhD, some are pilots, some are nurses, some are homemakers. We've got a whole cross-section. People of all ages and stages of life, and they're all saying, God is for us. Now I said, let's make it even more personal. God is for me. Say that. God is for me. God is for me. I want you to repeat that to yourself when you leave this place. On your way to where you're going to have lunch or going home or to work tomorrow, repeat the words out loud. God is for me. I took a section right out of the Bible, and I marinated it. I soaked it into a period of time. I repeated it over and over so they got that nugget to chew on. So I said, the next time this week you begin to deal with something that's beyond you to handle, repeat the words, God is for me which means he's going to help me with this. He's in touch with where I am right now. People need to have something to believe. You've not done your job as a preacher if you've not given them something to believe. First, we give them the gospel, and that's primary. But we give them so much more. If you're a preacher that only gives the gospel, you're only giving them milk to drink. They need meat to chew on. So be sure you go into the depths of Scripture. That's why I believe in expository preaching. Go through the book of the Bible that you teach. Take them through the books of the Bible. Go through Matthew. I've done all the New Testament books except Matthew. So that's what I'm doing right now. Taking them through the Matthew Gospel. Take your time. There's no rush unless you're afraid they're going to fire you. You know, then you got to get it said quick. But most of us are not about to be fired. You feed them well, you'll never be fired. Sheep come where there's great food. I mean, do you go to a doctor that does great medical work? You better believe it. Do you want him to tell you the truth? If he doesn't, it's called malpractice. People don't want to hear what they need to hear, what they like to hear. They want to hear what they need to hear. So I'm old enough now to tell them, I'm not going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you what you need. If I'm in medical work and a person needs to know there's a growth on the lung and we've got to do surgery, I don't do him a favor by making him feel good and leave. I tell him he's got a growth on his lung. We've got to do surgery. It could be malignant. 
we got to deal with this. Well, that's what I do as a preacher. That's what I do every time I'm on the radio. I tell them the truth. And I don't apologize for it. I don't insult them with it. I don't beat them up with it. I just tell them the truth. How do I know what it says? Hey, I just wrote the book on it. <laughs> Observation, interpretation, correlation, application. Every week of my life, listen to me, I go through that process. I'm not amazing. I'm just a hardworking, disciplined, careful reader and preacher of the scriptures. You can be that too. Anyone can be that. But you've got to learn how to feed your, uh, prepare your own meals. Or you'll always rely on somebody else. Well, Dr. Swindoll, it has been very helpful. It's so good to hear the way that you, um, just so much wisdom on how you prepare the Word of God, how you teach the Word of God. And uh, so I think a lot of people are going to be helped by this podcast and by the book. We'll link to the book in the show notes. But thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and for for sharing so much wisdom. Um, Well, you are very welcome, and I hope you are right. I hope it makes a difference. And I say to those who are preachers, Uh, I understand your world, and uh, I'm with you. God is for us, and I'm with you. (laughs) I understand what you're going through. May the Lord use this book, Searching the Scriptures in Your Life Especially. Well, thanks again to Dr. Charles Swindoll for joining us this week as our special guest on the Church Leaders Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a few minutes to subscribe, rate, and review us in iTunes, or consider sending this episode to someone you know who might benefit by listening to it. Also, you can download the show notes for this episode and every episode at churchleaders.com forward slash podcast. In the show notes, we always include resources, mention the show, and links to some of our guest top content on churchleaders.com and from around the web. As always, if you have ideas for how we can improve this podcast or guests that you'd love to hear us interview, you can email us at podcast at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next week. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website, churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.